Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Cy Montgomery, author of Cigarettes of the Octopus. Co-author is Warren Carlisle, head of Octonation. Um, it's the, the, the photos, which I can't show because there's a little block saying these show, photos will be in full color when it's released on March 19th by National Geographic. And it's, it's a companion to the anticipated National Geographic television special. I can show them. Yeah, you can show them. <laughs> um, I can show some of them. Anyway, when you tell me, I will do so. Okay. Well, well, the thing, well, the thing about it is, is that, yeah, the pictures, the photos are amazing and make such an integral part of the book, as well as um, the gloss, not glossary, but the catalog in the end that our co-author uh, used to create these wonderful photos and and uh, biographies of all the different types of octopuses. And so, anyway, as I was saying, you know, if you go back to some of the cool things people have said about Cy. One said she was part Emily Dickinson and part Indiana Jones. And I can go into all of her books, but there's so many, we can't talk about them. That's what, what the Boston Globe said. And what Cy said, which is kind of scary and kind of hopeful, depends on whether you're an optimist or not. She goes, we're on the cusp of either destroying the sweet green earth or revolutionizing the way we understand the rest of animate creation. And that's what she's been doing for her whole professional life. And so this journey into the world of the octopus that she's taken, you know, they have this large, basically, body that's also a brain. Um, and they they can adjust their genetic makeup um, to respond to the environment. They change colors. They change shape. You know, you can go to YouTube and see a video of a massive octopus getting out through the a quarter size hole. They sneak out of their tanks and eat other fish and then sneak back in when no one's looking. Um, and so with this latest offering, Sai is like, I, you know, she is like an octopus whisperer. And even though she's written about all these other animals, I still think this is, the octopus is her passion. So without further ado, oh yeah. And we last spoke when the first octopus book, The Soul of the Octopus, came out in 2015. And Sai was there for our book club and it was a lot of fun. So Welcome, Cy, uh, almost a decade later. I'm so pleased to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, right before we started, I was I mentioned the word sentience, and it may be a little bit of an oddball way of starting, but for the past five years, I've been interviewing lots of scientists, philosophers, medical professionals, all about where is the seat of human consciousness. And there's also the, and the head guys like David Chalmers, who positive the easy and hard question of consciousness and then also there's these guys who are panpsychists who believe that everything is sentient from a mountain to a moat of dust and psi touches upon this so actually it's integral because she's so entranced with the intelligence of these creatures let's talk about sentience because some of the people who read this book are going to think you're anthropomorphizing these guys well i think when I wrote The Soul of an Octopus, which came out in 2015, the title alone upset some people. Um, but after spending years in the company of octopuses who clearly recognized me, clearly chose to be with me, clearly enjoyed their time with me, I felt that if I have a soul, and there are people who debate whether the soul is even a real thing. There's people who even debate whether the self is a real thing. Right. But if I have a soul, so does an octopus. But this new book, The Secrets of the Octopus, is mostly about the science that has come out since that first book of mine appeared. And what these scientists are documenting about their intelligence can't be dismissed as anthropomorphism because these are very carefully devised experiments, sometimes in laboratories. They are observations that have been filmed in the wild objectively. And people are, are probing into not are they sentient, but 
what is the nature of their sentience? There is no question that these animals think and feel and know. There is no question that thinking, feeling, and knowing are adaptive. It really helps you live, particularly if, like an octopus, you are both at times a um, prey item and a predator, because you got to psych out both your own predators and your own prey. And to do that, when you've got such a, a Catholic menu and so many animals who want to eat you, to do that without having any kind of sentience is just not possible and ridiculous to assume that these animals solving complex problems are just randomly generating these answers to their complex lives. Well, take our dogs, who are both waiting patiently for us to complete this interview. Uh, you, when they say when you punish a dog or reward it, do it at that moment, because dogs essentially live in the moment. So are you suggesting, or is there any empirical evidence that either they have memory or a concept of future, or they use their past experience to, to shape their present activity? You know what I mean? Yes, have, absolutely. I, I guess basically what I'm saying is, are they aware of their own existence? Well, there have been some fabulous studies. I'm going to mention some done by Alex Schnell, who is one of the characters who keeps reappearing in Secrets of the Octopus and who wrote the beautiful introduction to the book. She's an Australian researcher, and she's very interested in the, the question of, of uh, what these animals are thinking and and how. Um, one of the things that she observed while filming the TV series that goes with this book is she has seen octopuses walking over very dangerous terrain where there's nowhere to hide. They will pick up a shell or two halves of a coconut and they will lug this thing vast distances it's difficult to do it too, because even when you have eight arms, it's it's just like you know a person carrying really he heavy luggage, and they'll lug these things for not just many you know dozens of yards, but hundreds of yards, until they are ready to build themselves essentially a Quonset hut from the two halves of the coconut shell, and then they'll put it together, and they've got themselves a nice safe structure. So that's something that they're not only planning for the, for the future, this is tool use also. One of the other hallmarks of great intelligence, or at least the intelligence that we humans recognize. There may be all kinds of intelligence that we don't even recognize right now. Just think of emotional intelligence. That wasn't even a thing when you and I were growing up. That was right. nothing. That was some hysterical woman ha having emotions, right? Well, now we recognize it as a really important kind of intelligence that helps us solve problems in our lives. Yeah, it's funny because, well, let me write this down because I'll forget the other question. But I'm glad you mentioned the introduction because both of you, setting the octopuses aside and going to your own minds, she talks about her first experience. And it's kind of a reciprocal love. And you do the same thing. And so how does that reciprocity arise? Because your response to the gentle touch and color changes is just as emotional as you suggest that hers is, the octopus. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I, I think we're all kind of, we, by animate creation, we're, we're wired for connection. And just like humans have had other species as partners throughout our existence, and dogs um, were very early partners of humans um, in hunting. Um, cheetahs have helped people hunt. In India, Maharajas had hundreds of cheetahs that helped them hunt. Um, the, the art of falconry is the art of uh, human hunting with often a bird and a dog together. Um, we now find, and this is one of the breathtaking findings in, in the book that I report on in, in uh, the third section of the book, um, 
that octopuses too cooperatively, cooperatively hunt with other species. And it's no wonder that we are wired to understand each other if we will just take the time to look. Now, mammals are easy. You know, we share 90% of our genetic material with a dog, 99% with a chimp, but, you know, 90% with every placental mammal. That's 90%. That's an A on a test. But we share 40% of our genetic material with a banana. <laughs> so That's we're perfect. all made of this. We're made of the same stuff. And I think um, we can understand each other much better than we even know if we only try. I, I, I'm thinking, of course, of Jane Goodall, who changed the whole course of ethology. She and her scientific sisters, Barute Galdikas, who studied orangutans in Borneo, and Diane Fossey, who studied mountain gorillas in Rwanda and Zaire, changed the course of ethology by entering into relationships with their study animals, using their empathy and intuition and their emotion, as well as their intellect, to understand who they were, not just what they were. And these days, whenever you go to study any animal's behavior, the first thing you do is figure out who's who, recognizing that everyone in that group is an individual. And octopuses are very individual. That's why you go to an aquarium and even if they won't admit it to the public behind the scenes, every octopus has a name and every octopus's name usually reflects who they are. Like Lucretia McEvil, who lived at the Seattle Aquarium and was named that because she tore up her whole tank all the time. And then there was Emily Dickinson, who was so shy, she never came out from behind the filter. They eventually let her go. Then there was another they called Leisure Suit Larry. And you can imagine what he was like. He, oh, one yeah. tentacle would be on. You'd pull that off. Another arm would come on. You'd pull that off. Three more would be on you. He just wouldn't let you go. So they are very individual, as are we. And Isn't their individuality is so obvious. Even we humans can recognize it. I find it interesting that it's so much easier for some people, in fact, maybe the only time in their life, that they've given unconditional love to something they can't or won't or are unable to give unconditional love to another person but to their dog it's completely unconditional and why is that is it because the relationship is simply just so clean that there's no mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah well one reason i i think and i want to know what you think too but one reason i think is that dogs chose domestication and no one will ever love you like a dog. <laughs> I mean, your spouse will love you, but their whole life isn't about their partnership with you. No, we want it to be. But dogs, th their whole being was created out of being able to read what we wanted so that they could get what they wanted from us. So they know when you're when you're sad and they don't even need to know language, although it is told I've, I've read that most dogs understand about 250 words. Um, they may not care what they mean, but they do understand them. So they don't even you don't have to say a word. They can tell from your posture. They can tell from your smell. They can tell from your, you know, the tone of your voice, how you're feeling. And they immediately rush to try to make you feel better. Yeah, it's like, uh, I love New Yorker cartoons about dogs. And uh, one of them is the dog at the door, just sitting there looking like scared. And then the person walks in and the dog goes, where were you? I was worried. Oh, so dear. You know, that's true. I'm sure. I'm sure it's. Well, but whereas the, the cat, when the, the cat goes, I right, where's my food? What the hell? <laughs> I know. I know. It's true. Cats are great. But boy, no one will love you like a dog. And, you know, your dog is never going to say to you like your kid will, I hate you, mommy. You know, right. your dog isn't going to say that dress makes you look fat. <laughs> um, <laughs> your dog is going to say, you smell great. <laughs> Give me some love.
Yeah, it's it's easy to do that. And I think I think people who have a problem with expressing the same type of emotion towards their spouse, their partner, their friends, their brothers are so attached to the dogs for that very reason. This is the one thing I can give to something alive and something I want to share the rest of my life with. And, and it won't know. be rejected. Because, right. you know, there there can be that day when, you know, your spouse or your child or your brother or your best friend just isn't in the mood to be around you. But your dog always is. Well, that reminds me of when you said goodbye to the octopus that was dying and she wouldn't take the fish. Well, you tell uh, the story. Yeah. You tell that story. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this yeah. was after I had known Octavia for a long time since the time that she arrived at the aquarium. Octopuses don't live very long, so a long time for an octopus is like two years. So um, she had laid eggs. They were infertile, and she'd been guarding them. So for months and months and months, she wasn't accepting food from our hands or playing with us because she was so busy taking care of her eggs. She didn't know they were infertile. So um, usually a female giant Pacific octopus will die six months after she lays her eggs and she may be able to see her babies hatch and use some of her last breaths to blow them out of the rocky lair in which she has laid the eggs into the open ocean and then she dies. But Octavia held on and six months went by, the eggs didn't hatch, but they were still there seven months, eight months, nine months, 10 months went by. And all that time we'd been handing her food on a grabber, but we hadn't been looking at her from, she'd been hiding in her lair. So we hadn't played with her. She hadn't tasted us. 10 months is a long time in the life of an animal who only lives three to five years. So um, I still wanted to say goodbye when she began to die. Our keeper, Bill Murphy, had her moved away from her eggs at the end of her life because she developed an eye infection and wanted her to be in a quiet, uh, dark place where she could die peacefully. So he'd removed her to a barrel, um, which is more like what a wild octopus would be experiencing at the end of her life. And I was with Wilson Menashe, my dear friend at the aquarium, and we opened the top of the barrel to say goodbye. We didn't know that she would recognize us anymore. She was old and she was sick and she had a big swollen eye. And to our amazement, she she floated up to the top of the big barrel and looked at us in the face. And we handed her a fish, but she didn't want the fish. She took the fish and just set it aside. What she did was she reached up and one last time held us in her suckers while looking into our faces. And to do that took an enormous effort. She was old, she was probably very uncomfortable. She was dying, but she bothered to come up from the bottom of that barrel to get to the surface, to touch us one last time. And I don't know for sure what was in her three hearts, but I know she made that choice and it cost her something to make that choice. She only had so much more strength, so many more hours of life and she chose to come to us. Isn't it fascinating how you're close to crying and I'm close to crying? Why is that? I think because we are all connected and we recognize that. We recognize that moment. There was a, a wonderful book titled Mama's Last Hug. And it was a book by a very famous ethologist telling about an old chimpanzee who was maybe 30 years old, who'd been living at a, a zoo in Europe. And she was on her death nest. And one of her old friends came from another country to say goodbye to her. And there's video of this chimpanzee as she looks up through her old eyes that are clouded with cataracts, recognizes her old friend. A huge smile spreads across her face. Her arms fly open and she embraces him in a hug. It's unmistakable that she was so happy to see him. Well, that exact same thing happened to me 
and an octopus, an animal with whom we last shared a common ancestor half a billion years ago when everyone was a tube. <laughs> Um, you know, you mentioned, and you mentioned in the book about how octopuses die sometimes at the hands of man, oft times. Um, have you ever, since you've studied so many animals and so many books about different ones from pigs to dolphins, I want to talk about dolphins in a minute. Um, have you ever wondered about lifespans? Because we're talking about two oh, years. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, at first it just kills you to think that here's this intelligent animal, an octopus that's um, you know, in many ways, far more intelligent than we are. They could ask, you know, how many different colors can your severed arm turn in, you know, one fifth of a second? Zero? You must be a real idiot. I feel bad for you. Um, they're very smart animals. How is it that their lives are so short? That just kills me. Oh. But I hope that at the end of Octavia's life, she felt that she'd fulfilled her octopus destiny. And it surely was a life that was filled with sensation, more sensation than we process in our 70 or 80 years. Think of it, their skin tastes as well as feels. They are capable of changing color pattern and shape. They are experiencing parts of the world that we do not. They can see polarized light. They do not have a blind spot visually. You know, they they're, they they see quite well, actually. Um, their chemo, uh, chem chemical tasting um, and smelling sorts of abilities are, are very sophisticated. A lot's going on in their lives. So maybe they're able to pack a full life yeah. to that yeah. short period. They say as people get older, the reason why time goes faster is because there's less stimulus, less things happening than when you're young. So really, if we wanted to get metaphysical, it's more a concept of what is time than mm -hmm. how long they live. It's experience, really. Time is a construct. You know, I was listening to the clock ticking this morning while I was getting ready. And each I was I, you always think like, you know, why doesn't it just stop for give us a rest? It'll just stop <sighs> for a couple of seconds so we can take a breath. And, well, you uh, know, the book before this one, I examined that very thing. It's called yeah. of Time and Turtles. And turtles yeah. live really long, you know. Many turtles can live over 100 years. One lived, that we know of, to at least 288 years and was alive when George Washington was alive. Um, well, not much happens to them, so maybe that go goes. Well, you know, they do. One way of measuring, like, how we experience time is something called flicker fusion frequency. And what that is, you know how until HTTV, which I don't understand HD at all, but used to be the television was a series of still photographs that just moved so rapidly we saw it as motion. And which is why our dogs who see things faster often were not interested in the television because it just was showing a series of stills. Hawks, hawks can see a hummingbird's wings individually beating, we see a buller. Um, so different animals can be tested to see at what point they stop seeing still images and start seeing motion. Well, not all turtles have been tested and there's hundreds of species, but the turtles that have been tested show that they see slowly and they probably don't even see the car that's gonna run them over if the driver doesn't move. They probably don't even see that because it's going faster than anything they have to process. It's rel so, as an observer, it's relativity. That's yeah. Exactly what it is. You know, I was thinking uh, ye yesterday there was an article in the Washington Post about grandmother whales. And oh, yes. They have, yes, they, yes, yes. have me they go through menopause and they were thinking, why of all creatures, why do they go through menopause? And then they really discovered that to take care of their grandchildren. Yes. And their male offspring in particular live far longer if there's a grandmother in the pod. So there's wisdom in age, you know, the ancient ones know stuff. And elephants are another great example. You know, if if your herd is traveling and there's a drought, you do not want the, you know, 25 year old robust male leading you. He doesn't know anything. You want a grandmother elephant leading you because she remembers that, oh yeah, there was another drought like 
35 years ago and the water hole to go to was right over here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the memory, the memory of an elephant. I mean, an elephant never forgets. And that right. started hundreds of years ago. So I was, I was wondering another thing. What? Oh, first of all, let's go back to the beginning because luckily you are appealing to a lay audience. That's who you want to appeal to. And so I guess you should explain who's in the class of cephalopods, whether, you know, cuddle, cuttlefish and squid and so forth. Who's in it and why are they all bunched together in this classroom? Well, cephalopods, um, cephalopods are all mollusks, which is a larger group, which includes clams and snails, which is what makes the intelligence of the octopus so jaw-droppingly strange because we don't think of clams and snails as particularly smart. Clams, for example, don't even have a brain. However, I've met some animals that don't have a brain and they do just fine. But anyway, yeah, the, the cephalopods, um, none of them have skeletons or shells and they have grasped grasping arms with suckers on them so um as a class the reason that i wanted to focus on octopus is one squids a lot of squids have a claw in their sucker so you don't want to be messing with them and they're also sometimes hard to keep in captivity cuttlefish now cuttlefish are totally awesome and they are actually easier to work with in the laboratory than are octopuses they don't try to escape as often and some of alex schnell's really interesting um experiments in the laboratory on how these animals minds work uh have been done with cuttlefish they they um are are more tractable Oct octopuses are they're always trying to get out of their tanks and you know they're very moody Apparently, um, the uh, cuttlefish are a little easier to deal with, um, mm -hmm. and they can they can all well. There is one species of octopus I just learned this that can't change color. Interestingly, but most of them can change color, um, and they're found in all of the world's all of the world's seas. What, what's interesting, uh, anatomically. And again, as you said, in 2015, you couldn't search these things up, but now YouTube has hundreds of videos. How is it possible for an octopus that's <clears throat> as big as a suitcase to, as I was saying, fit through a hole the size of a quarter? No one is going, no one, when you watch it, it's, it's not really happening because you can't believe it's happening because there's no way it could happen. I, so, I know, it's so amazing. They Because the only hard part in their body is their beak. People can't even believe they have a beak, but all cephalopods do have a beak. I could even show you one, I have two in my office, but it looks just like a parrot. And where is the beak located? In their armpits. I mean, they are so weirdly organized compared to us. You know, they, their head isn't even where you think it is. Most people think the head is the big blobby thing up here, like, cause we have a big blobby thing up there. And, and then we have our, our torso and then we have our, our limbs. They go torso, essentially, or the mantle. That's that big blobby thing. And then after that, the place where the eyes are, that is the head. And, and then their limbs are attached to their head, which is why you turn them over and you see their, their beak is in their armpits. Well, how do they, for want of a better word, how are they... And I understand they have no skeleton, but how are they gelatinous enough? And that's not the right word that they can make their body so small. And, you know, like I was saying, the ones that escape their tanks, go and eat another fish and come back in their tanks the next day. So the, their, their, their keepers don't know what they've been doing. How is it even possible? It doesn't seem possible. I know. Well, you know what? It's, it's easier if you think of their muscles more like our tongues than our arms and legs. You know how you can take your tongue and and stick it down in the in the Coke bottle, um, even though it looks like a great big tongue, but you can stick it down there. That's how they can take their their arms and then pour the rest of their body through these these tiny openings. And they can also make themselves look really big if they want to, because, um, again, they change color and shape and they change the texture of their skin also. But that makes it really hard to study them, too because it's essential to know who's who, but 
okay, I'm following a red octopus, a really big red. Oh, wait a minute, it's gone. But over there is a brown octopus. Oh, wait, there's a spotted one over here. That might be the same octopus because in a fifth of a second, they can completely change their color and shape. You also talk about, I mean, there's an upside to that. And the downside is when they cruise around in the ocean, they're very vulnerable because pretty much anybody can come and just- They're a big packet of unprotected, delicious protein. But that's another thing that has sculpted their intelligence. Because losing the ancestral shell, that made them vulnerable, but it also freed them up to hunt. But in order to survive, they have all of these different predators they have to worry about. Everybody can eat them. I mean, when they're little, everyone does eat them. They're actually plankton when they're little, a part of the plankton. But, you know, um, seals and whales and birds and fish and sharks and all of these different taxa, wildly different taxa with different senses, with different, you know, habitats, birds dive out of the sky and eat them. Whales come along and eat them. Things that can see polarized light eat them. Things that can't see polarized light eat them. Um, and meanwhile, they eat a whole bunch of different things too. Because when they get big enough, they could eat a baby shark. They can eat an, an eagle. Um, did you see? There was a video of a an octopus who caught an eagle. Actually, the eagle was rescued um, by some passing people. That boy, that eagle didn't know what he, he, he didn't know how lucky he was. But, you know, all of these all of these different creatures in their lives, they have to psych them out. They have yeah, to figure why... out how do I evade this one? And this is why, you know, they can change color, they can change shape, they can shoot ink, they can jet away, they can blend in with their background, or they can stand out and look like something that they're not, which is yeah. one of the other features of camouflage that we don't often think of. We think of camouflage as just you become invisible because you look like your background. But as we go into in the in the book, uh, many octopuses succeed not by blending in, but by standing out and making the animals around them think they're a completely different thing. They can, there's some, the mimic octopus, that can look like a poisonous flatfish and in a second turn into a bunch of banded sea snakes. There's other octopuses that look like the weather. They can do a display called passing cloud and it just looks like a cloud is passing overhead. Um, right. And they don't just randomly do this. They do it thinking, aha, I know how to confuse this predator. So to me, that demonstrates clearly that they have something called theory of mind. Being able to think of what someone else different from themselves is thinking. And I think in the Darwinian sense, it's obvious to me that they would have been naturally selected out unless they got smart. Right. I mean, seems like, okay, like you were saying about how easy, what easy prey they are in one sense, they would go, it would be, they would have been gone, but for the fact that they thought, you know, I can figure, I think I can figure this out. And, and it's funny because for a long time, I thought dolphins were smarter than us because they couldn't manipulate the environment like octopuses could, or we can. And so since they couldn't manip manipulate the, the environment, all they could do was think. So they had plenty of time to think about the cosmos in a Buddhist kind of way. Oh, wow. Or there's the octopus is kind of like the mechanic of the sea. You know, <sighs> he's got lots of things he can do with the environment. You know, he's, he's, he's got jobs to do. Dolphins don't have the, those kinds of jobs because they don't have arms and legs. They don't have tentacles. They don't have things that allow them to, to mix with the planet in some ways. Right, right. They do have, however, echolocation. So and they can see with sound. And um, some animals, anyway, can even use that sound to do more than, than see with. And, and they do communicate. They have, um, as you know, they have individual signature whistles. So they can announce, okay, it's, it's Joe coming. Um, or, you know, calling Helen. Helen, where are you? Over long, long distances too, and, and whales even more so. Yes, right. Well, let's go back to the um, your co-author and the photographs and the cataloging at the end and the series, which, when does the series come out? Um, that'll come out on Earth Day appropriately. And you can see it on Disney Channel because Disney now owns National Geographic. I know. Yeah, and um, it's a three-part knockout 
series, I I got to see stuff that I I'd never never seen before, and many things have just never been filmed before, and that is because Adam Geiger, who was the head of Sea Light Productions, spent so much time just letting the octopuses that he was filming know who he was. They had these rebreathers, so you could stay down for hours and hours and hours, day after day after day. He just stayed down there, unmoving, and allowed those animals to recognize him as harmless, and eventually. They, they figured out who, who he was. And, and then he would bring in people like Alex Schnell, who, when she appeared, you know, she's great with octopuses anyway, but those octopuses were already habituated to human presence. And so they accepted Alex as well. And so not only did he get to see and film these things, so did Alex. So scientists are like in the film seeing some of these things for the first time. And some of the things that, that you get to see, oh my gosh, I mean, I think I would just, I would just be screaming underwater with excitement to, to see some of these things. Um, one of the things they filmed was um, an octopus who was being attacked by a this particular kind of shrimp that can poke you with really sharp stuff, uh, spines that really hurts. And this octopus was being bothered by it. So he looked around and he saw, oh, here's a big flat shell. And he grabbed it and he held it up like a shield. I mean, tool use, absolutely tool use. Um, in other cases, there were times when the octopus was so used to the filmmaker that the octopus would just crawl into his hand. To, to just felt that comfortable. So anyway, and the, the photographs in the book are, are fabulous. And I'm glad that you're calling out uh, Warren um, and his fabulous Octo profiles. Warren Carlyle is the founder of Octo Nation, as you mentioned earlier, which is the world's largest octopus club. And he founded it after he read my first book on octopus, The Soul of an Octopus. And it now, now in this past year, half a billion people have viewed its online content. Octo Nation has, it has all kinds of cool merch, but it also has, you know, amazing photo galleries to which all its members contribute. It has several PhD scientists on staff. It has activities for children. It has virtual tours of aquariums. It has videos. It has games. It has classroom activities. It's just an amazing thing. So I think one of the best things I contributed to the book was suggesting that we have Warren do these octo profiles. And so he's done, here I'll show you, um, for example, here's the um, Caribbean dwarf octopus. This is one that, that divers may often see. And he tells you about this little animal. He's just the size of a marble and he lives in the Caribbean Sea. Um, then he talks about the coconut octopus. Oh, and yeah. that's the one that grabs the shells um, and lugs them around. There's the blue ringed octopus. This one is so venomous that basically there's no antidote for this animal. You're either going to die or you're not. Um, and each one of these does something totally different from the others. Look at this one. It's called the hairy octopus. It looks like it's covered with hair. It's just bizarre, some of these animals. And here's the Dumbo octopus. Look at him. His These are fins on the side of his head. And he inhabits the deep, deep sea. Octopuses, there's hundreds of species and they keep finding new ones. They just found four new species like last month. There's even octopuses that have antifreeze in their blood and live in Antarctica. There is octopuses who live in the volcanic vents in the ocean in 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There are octopuses, most of them don't live long enough, but there's some mother octopuses who will spend four years taking care of their eggs in the deep, deep sea. They That's all funny. have these amazing abilities. They all like completely fill up your soul with awe. It's funny because in 2015, the book club, when you were there, I was amazed at how passionate you were. And here we are almost a decade later. How can you still be so passionate after all these years? Look how excited you 
<laughs> How excited you get. Well, you're pretty excited too. I am. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> contagious. It's totally contagious. Oh my God. Well, this is the thing. I mean, since 2015, all this new stuff has come out to keep you excited. And each time, you know, a question gets answered, 10 new ones come up. And you know what? When we, when you love someone or something, you want to know everything about it, you know? If you fall in love, what you want to know of your beloved is what's it like to be you? And we're answering those questions now. What was it like to be Octavia, my beloved friend, or Kali? What did it feel like to be her? And I really feel like their stories and their spirits, even though those animals have passed, they're still kind of doing good work in the world. Yeah, you say that in the book. And it's interesting because when I was a kid, I loved science fiction. And there's this book called Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. And what it does is it has images on each page of, a, of an alien that's written about by either Ray Bradbury or Robert Heinlein or Theodore Sturgeon and Arthur C. Clarke. But each one is drawn as if it was the picture, just like your catalog. And so then when I looked at the catalog, it reminded me of that. And they're all so different, but they're in this class and they share something essential. And I don't know what you would, I mean, I'm looking at one of the pictures now. Yeah. So they all have eight appendages and they all can do similar things, but then sometimes completely different things. So what is it that they share in common? And again, I think you're going to get passionate about it because you're going to get emotional about it, but try not to try to make it like, <laughs> try to just say, what is it that they share? And don't say it's like love for mankind. <laughs> well, I don't know if they have any sense, they probably don't have a no, lot of love for not mankind because we're ruining the ocean as fast but as Or if you go to a sushi restaurant. Right. Oh my God. Well, what do they all share with all, um, no bones, eight limbs, taste with their skin, uh, sh short lives and senses that we would consider superpowers. And that's with, would you say that's without exception within the class and within the? Yeah, I would I would say that is without exception, and and just endlessly they're endlessly surprising. When you said billions of years, when did we actually split apart? Um, half a billion years ago. Half a billion, yeah, that was the last time we shared a common ancestor. Um, so. That's when we that's when we split. And and we were, you know, we we looked every every live thing was a tube back. Every live animal was a tube back then with very little differentiation. Nobody had skeletons. Um, yeah. Nobody had, you know, chambered hearts. Nobody had um, organs specifically dedicated to digestion. Nobody had anything like a brain. Nobody, you know, it, it was just kind of an idea of of life we we are so different you would have to go to outer space or science fiction to find someone more different from a human than an octopus and this well, look, is why it's so astonishing that we can be friends <laughs> look at things like cockroaches or crocodiles mm. they used to stage an evolution hundreds of millions of years ago where they go you know what this is fine i don't need to do anything i can just stay like this and right. this, this works <laughs> yeah, and after a nuclear war, there'll still be cockroaches walking around. So, but are octopuses continually? I mean, there's so many different ones. Are they continue to? Are they continuing as we we're evolving ourselves now? But did they evolve further and continue to evolve? To oh yeah, because there's so many different species of them. There's yeah. so many different kinds of them. Um, they're all they're in all kinds of different habitats. Um, you know from deep sea hot vents to antarctica and and to live in those different habitats you have to evolve all kinds of new talents um octopuses can edit their own rna um rna all right rna and dna are what 
code for proteins and we're made out of proteins and everything our organs do depends on the kinds of proteins that we make. Um, and they can evolve very rapidly because, because of this. They can just change very, very rapidly because of this. Imagine if you could suddenly be like, you know what, I really need to change the proteins in my body right now. <laughs> um, climate change would not be so big of a problem for us if we could do that. Although it would be a problem for everything else. And because we're part of everything else, even if humans survive, if every, everything else went to hell, that would be the end of us anyway. And who wants to live in that kind of world nonetheless? But yeah, they they certainly have continued to evolve. And what's funny too is that, I mean, it just seems like every week we're finding a new kind of octopus that nobody even knew was out there. How many, spe how many species are there? We don't know. I mean, there's hundreds that we have identified, but um, there's, we don't, we don't know. We haven't really begun to explore the ocean. True. So, and also there could be octopuses that just think, I mean, so many divers until Solon Octopus came out, pretty much every diver I ever talked to, they'd never seen an octopus. But that's because they're hidden. And that's because they can pour themselves into a little corner and not be seen. It is so easy to be inches away from an octopus and not see it. So they're out there, but often we're not seeing them. We're seeing them more now because we're looking for them. Well, and it's funny because like in my aquarium, which is a fairly big aquarium, you know, I have a really big Placostomus. He has no desire for me to look at him. He has no, because no he's shy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But then when he sees something interesting, then he sucks to the side of the aquarium, looks around. But then, you know, he's done with me and he'll go back in and hide behind his driftwood and just enjoy staying there. Mm. And, you know, it's a it, like I said, when you look at the I mean, when you, it's an understatement to say a picture is worth a thousand words, because coupled with your text and with the ultra, ultra 4K high definition images, um, the two things together, it's like a portmanteau. They, they, they some of their parts exceeds the whole. Is that right? Some of their parts. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> it happens in this book, which is why it's going to be so popular coupled with the series. And I guess as we conclude, let me ask you this, because you're optimistic, at least as far as I can see, and I'm somewhat pessimistic generally. And that quote that I read about the fact that I mean, the earth would be great if we weren't here. It's not, it's not save the planet. It's the earth would be glad if one species was gone. It, it could have a great time. Yes. <laughs> but so are you cautiously optimistic that we're going to turn around and make a 90 degree turn and change our ways? Or are you scared and pessimistic, especially given our, what's going on in the world today? I know, I know. Well, I feel like I kind of have no choice but to feel optimistic because everything I do is hopefully to be part of that change. I mean, if if you know how how people when they have a, a drug problem or, or a, an addiction to alcohol, often you kind of have to hit bottom before you realize, oh man, we've got to change. And if God's hand came out of the sky and like pointed at us, it could not be more obvious that we have got to change. The world is on fire. We are choking on our own pollution. By 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Um, our, our crops are dying. Our pollinators are dying. We have got to change things. And, and it's, it's not just a bunch of tree huggers who are saying this, and it's not just the elite scientists. If you watch birds, if you garden, you know that the climate is changing. And if you know anyone who has asthma, you know that our air is polluted by fossil fuels. And I think things are starting to turn around. And that's why I think 
you know, when I when I see how tough things are out there, I feel like this is a great time to be alive because then you can use your talent to do something important, to do something brave, you know, and, and I'm I'm delighted to be some small part of what I hope is going to be a big change. And when I look at the young people who are my friends, you know, one of my one of my best friends is uh, 15 and she is on fire to she's just loves this world and all of her friends are just incandescently in love with our world and want to preserve it and they have the courage and they have the ideas to do it that's the end of your quote you have the same passion and idealism and i don't know how someone can have idealism as long as you've had it i've tried but the best thing you can do i think and I think this is true of the creatures we've been talking about is living in the moment. And as Warren Zevon said, enjoy every sandwich. And, you know, I think that's what I take away. I take away from a lot of this. And I think if you do that, especially in the concept of time that we've been talking about, I think that goes a long way because I look out my window now and I look at the trees beginning to bud and I go, okay, like the cockroaches, this is fine. Mm. And I hope it stays that way. So anyway, what I would like to do one day is we switch libraries. I come to your house, you come here. It would be novel. I'd no love problem. that. I'd love to look through your library. And you are always welcome to look look through mine. Well, it's a pleasure seeing you again. And don't keep don't stay away for a decade this time. And and now that we can do more virtual stuff, or if you're ever in the area, it would be great if you could come by and see us. I would love that. I would love that. All right. Thanks again, Sai. It was Thank really good to you. This was a joy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.